Hello, welcome to all. I am Terry Brabel, Regent of Captain Molly Corbin Chapter. We are so proud to honor the Commemorative Events Committee by sponsoring this birthday party for the 19th Amendment, which was ratified 100 years ago today by the state of Tennessee. Please stand with me as we have a very special flag ritual. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On Thank you to these children for this flag ritual. We are honored to have guests with us today. The National Chair of the Commemorative Events Committee, Mrs. Betty Bird, a true Texas lady. Welcome, Mrs. Bird. The National Vice Chair for the Commemorative Events Committee, the 100th anniversary of suffrage, Mrs. Catherine Carlton. And we're very pleased to have you with us, Mrs. Carlton. The Texas State Chair for Commemorative Events, Mrs. Carolyn Shiwi and Mrs. Jane Dockler. These ladies are honored members of the Captain Molly Corbin chapter. We have some other very special ladies whom you will meet a little later in our birthday celebration. Now you might have noticed that I am wearing a purple, white, and gold sash that says votes for women. This sash is similar to the ones worn by the suffragettes in their fight for our vote. Our chapter celebrated the 19th Amendment at our November Veterans Luncheon in 2019. The entire luncheon was dedicated to the 19th Amendment, from the beautiful centerpieces of sunflowers to the enormous backdrop featuring the suffragettes as they march forth for the vote, to the reading of the diaries of many of these women. The members present and the guests present received this beautiful sash, which was made by Mrs. Carolyn Shiwi, state co-chair for the Commemorative Events Committee. We honor this momentous occasion that occurred so long ago, 100 years ago. So let us go back in time. We're going to be listening to Miss Phoebe Byrne, known as Miss Phoebe to her friends, as she reads from her diary. It is my pleasure to introduce Miss Phoebe. It's been a year since the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I wrote about it in my diary. Let me see what I wrote. I am so excited. I can't believe I got to vote for the President of the United States in 1920. I voted for President Warren G. Harding on November the 2nd, 1920. It wasn't easy to vote. There were lots of restrictions and that kept many ladies at home, even though they had that wonderful right. And to think I might have played a part in getting that right. It was on the night before the final ratification of the amendment my state of Tennessee was to be the last state to ratify the constitutional amendment. I am so proud of my son, Harry. He became the youngest member of the Tennessee State Legislature. He was only 22 years old when elected. And this is how the story all got started. 
he was to be one of the legislators to vote for the amendment. For over 70 years, women had struggled to get the right to vote. When I was born in 1873 in Eastern Tennessee with the name of Phoebe, but I was known by the nickname of Phoebe, most people thought I was by all accounts feisty, strong-willed, and incredibly well-read, and they were right. After graduating from Tennessee Wesleyan, I became a teacher, and then I married my beloved James Lafayette Byrne. Harry was our oldest. I subscribed to and read four different newspapers and a dozen magazines. So I was educated on both local and national politics. And although my part of Tennessee was conservatively anti-suffrage, I always thought of how the illiterate, uninformed male tenants on our farm were allowed to vote, but I could not. The streets of Nashville, the capital, were crowded that morning. Suffragists and anti-suffragists, both Tennessean locals and national visitors, had been flooding the state capitol ever since Governor A. H. Roberts called a special session of the state Congress to vote on what would become the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Identified by the color of a rose they wore pinned to their dress or suit, red rose against and yellow rose for, the lobbyists from both sides kept busy picturing, petitioning, praying, and at times bribing and blackmailing, each trying to outwork the other to achieve their goal. I worried about my son because he was so young and I felt easily influenced by the older experienced legislators and by his railroad job. I was afraid they would get him on the side of the anti-people. Today, I was reading a barrage of bitter anti-suffrage letters to the editor in the local paper when I felt compelled to write to Harry. I had to write a letter to him. I had to tell him what he should do. So the night before, on August the 17th, I composed a lengthy letter ending with a strong suggestion. He told me later about his day and the pressure he had been put under. This is exactly what he told me. He said, after weeks of intense lobbying and debate within the Tennessee legislature, a motion to table the amendment was defeated with a 48 to 48 tie. The speaker called the measure to a ratification vote. To the dismay of the many suffragists who had packed into the Capitol with their yellow roses, sashes, and signs, it seemed certain that the final roll call would maintain the deadlock. But that morning, Harry Byrne, my son, who until that time had fallen squarely in the anti-suffrage camp, received a note from his mother. On this day in history, August 18, 1920, Tennessee's youngest state representative, me, Harry T. Byrne, sat in my Nashville hotel room poring over a letter from mother, postmarked August 17th. Most of the seven-page um, seven page note was inconsequential, even mundane. It was raining. Uncle Bob had stopped by. Would Harry be home for Labor Day? I couldn't pay attention to him. I just read and reread the last part of Miss Phoebe's letter. Dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech. It was very bitter. I've been watching to see how you stood 
but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Thomas Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat into ratification? Ha! Huh. No more from Mama this time. With lots of love, Mama. But there was one line that Byrne couldn't stop reading. Hurrah and vote for suffrage. His mother, Phoebe Byrne, Miss Phoebe, wrote, don't keep them in doubt. Byrne folded the letter, put it into his pocket, and then he pinned a red rose to his lapel and walked out the door. The rest is history. Too soon, the clerk reached his name. Harry cleared his throat. I. Every head in the assembly turned to stare at the 24-year-old upstart. Nobody could believe their ears. He'd probably misspoken. Byrne raised his chin defiantly. The vote ended 49 votes for women's suffrage, 47 against. In a history-making moment, Harry pulled the red rose out of his lapel and voted for the 19th Amendment. Pandemonium broke out, but the die had been cast. With Harry Byrne's vote, urged by his mother, Phoebe Byrne, Tennessee ratified the 19th Amendment and it became constitutional law. Yes, history will always say that August 18, 1920 was a historic day. But I will always know in my heart that it was really the night of August 17, 1920, when I was inspired to compose a letter to my son, Harry Byrne, the youngest member of the Tennessee legislative body. That November, millions of mothers all over the nation headed to the polls to vote in the 1920 presidential election. For some, it was their first time. For others, such as the Utah women who had gained suffrage first in 1870 and then again in 1896, it was their 20th. But whether they were new or experienced voters, each of the women felt the thrill of finally sharing their insights, their opinions, and their wisdom, not just with their sons and daughters, but with their leaders, their states, and nation as well. History is usually made up of human events, little known and sometimes thought of as unimportant. But when we look back, these events are what create the fiber of history. And that leads me to another thought, the struggle, the human sacrifice, the earth changing events had other small happenings like the friendship between two pathfinding ladies. I wonder what their story is all about. My name is Susan B. Anthony. I began teaching when I was 15 and taught until I was 30. I think that the first seed for thought was planted during my early days as a teacher. I saw the injustice of paying men double and triple women's wages for teaching merely because they were men. I am Elizabeth Cady Stanton. On Sunday, July 9th, 1848, five reform-minded women decided to hold a woman's rights convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious rights of women. We wrote the call that evening and published it in the Seneca County Courier the next day, giving only five days notice. I was the principal author of a list of grievances and resolutions titled the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled explicitly on the Declaration of Independence, which gave American men their political rights some 70 years earlier. It stated, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal 
I read the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention, and it was followed by the passage of 12 resolutions relating to women's rights. The only resolution that did not pass unanimously was that which called for women's suffrage. 100 individuals signed in support of the Declaration of Sentiments, 68 women and 32 men, including abolitionist Frederick Douglass. I first heard of women's suffrage when I read about the Woman's Declaration of Independence issued from the Seneca Falls Convention. The report started startled and amused me, and I laughed heartily at the novelty and presumption of the demands based on how the journalists portrayed them in the papers. I came home at the end of my school term to visit my family. Mrs. Stanton and Mrs. Mott had just been in Rochester, and I was surprised to find that my sober Quaker parents and sister, having attended the Rochester meetings, regarded them as very profitable and interesting, and the demands made as proper and reasonable. I didn't understand suffrage, but I knew I wanted equal wages with men teachers. Mrs. Stanton framed the Declaration of Sentiments in the same manner as the Declaration of Independence. Thus, the women at Seneca Falls connected their arguments for equal rights to the founding American principles. By tying the complaints of the women to the most distinguished political statement the nation had made, Mrs. Stanton implied that the women's demands were no more or less radical than the American Revolution was. These were the hasty initiative steps of the most momentous reform that had yet been launched on the world, the first organized protest against the injustice which had brooded for ages over the character and destiny of one half the race. The Declaration of Sentiments became the framework for the woman's suffrage movement. My mother's father was American Revolutionary Patriot Private Daniel Reed from Massachusetts when I joined the Irondequa chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in Rochester, New York in 1898. I lamented that I could not take a more active role. I wrote the members, I have been and must continue to be busy working to secure for the women of this day the paramount rights for which the Revolutionary War was waged. We are are both granddaughters of revolutionary patriots. My maternal grandfather was James Livingston. He was a colonel in the Continental Army, assisting in the capture of John Andre, one of Benedict Arnold's co-conspirators. One of the greatest services rendered by Miss Anthony to the suffrage cause was in casting a vote in the presidential election of 1872 in order to test the rights of women under the 14th Amendment. For this offense, the brave woman was arrested. After I was arrested for voting, I undertook an exhausting tour throughout Monroe County where my trial was to be held to lecture on the question, is it a crime for a citizen of the United States to vote? To argue my position, I quoted the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and Supreme Court decisions. The U.S. District Attorney acknowledged the effectiveness of my persuasive speech. He concluded he could hardly find 12 men so ignorant on citizens' rights as to agree on a verdict of guilty. Therefore, the trial was moved to Ontario County. The trial was a sham. I was not allowed to testify because I was not a competent witness. The judge preempted the jurors' role by ordering them to find a verdict of guilty. It was the greatest judicial outrage in history. At my sentencing, I was finally permitted to speak. The judge yelled throughout my speech for a total of six times that I should sit down. I was fined $100 plus court costs. Under the law, the judge should have sent me to prison until I paid my fine. Then I would have had the right to appeal to a higher court. The judge thwarted that possibility by saying that the court will not order me committed until the fine is paid. I never paid the fine and there was never any attempt to collect it. The judge's conduct was thoroughly denounced. Susan's trial was an outrage, but I lacked indignation. My continuous wrath against the whole dynasty of tyrants has not left one stagnant drop of blood in my veins to rouse for any single act of insult. Let me explain. Men's dominance in public life disable and disgrace women non-stop. With men as the chief arbiters of legal and political right, women are rendered civilly dead. Women are powerless to stop their husbands if they choose to squander the family's resources, even if the source of those resources is the wages 
savings or inheritance that women themselves bring into their households. A husband can hit his wife with abandon and put her away in an institution. Men make all the laws regarding education, employment, marriage, divorce, child custody, property, inheritance, breaches of the civil and criminal codes, every aspect of life that can and do affect women's lives, but over which women are powerless to affect change. Men thus become like monarchs ruling over all classes of society who can readily wield tyrannical force if they will to do so. So, you see, I just cannot be any more outraged. It is often said by those who know Miss Anthony best that she has been my good angel, always pushing and goading me to work, and that but for her pertinacity I should never have accomplished the little I have. On the other hand, it has been said that I forged the thunderbolts and she fired them. You just fired a few thunderbolts yourself. The United States celebrated its centennial in 1876. Patriotic events were scheduled to run from January through June, culminating with a gala on the 4th of July in Philadelphia. We noted that the Centennial Celebration Committee neglected to plan events that honored women's contributions or even to include women participants at the gala celebration. We were refused a seat on the platform of the main event on July 4th. The National Women's Suffrage Association passed a resolution pointing out that one half of the citizens of this nation, after a century of boasted liberty, are still political slaves and demand justice for the women of this land. Through 50 years, we stirred up the world to recognize the rights of women. We little dreamed when we began this contest, optimistic with the hope and buoyancy of youth, that half a century later, we would be compelled to leave the finish of the battle to another generation of women. But our hearts are filled with joy to know that they enter upon this task equipped with a college education, with business experience, with the fully admitted right to speak in public, all of which were denied to women 50 years ago. They have practically one point to gain, the suffrage we had all. Were we radical? I believe I was very radical, but no more or less than the writers of the Declaration of Independence. I know I was radical. I was despised and ridiculed by everyone across the country. I have the gratification of my 50 years work and the knowledge of the good that I feel I have done. We have asked men for the one privilege that includes all the others. They have replied by yielding to us in smaller matters. I couldn't have written the hundreds of articles and speeches without you, Susan. You fired my soul and brain to work up the thunder and lightning. I I do believe that I have developed into much more of a woman under your jurisdiction than left to myself reading novels in an easy chair. When I am asked for examples of the actual benefits to women that have resulted from the suffrage agitation of the past 50 years, I proudly offer that women's position in America is better today than ever before. There are four states where women have their proper rights and where they vote every election day to the great advantage of the city, state, and nation. Women's position was plainly defined 50 years ago. She was supposed to stay at home and wait to get married, have children, and keep the house. Just imagine, when I began my work, it was not considered reputable for a woman to sell goods in a shop. But the fact that women can earn their livings today side by side with men is due to us too. The young woman who makes good income as a doctor, lawyer, or a businesswoman is apt to consider that her success is wholly due to her own talent and charm. But the truth is that she would be sitting quietly at home today if agitation had not smoothed the way for her. For being released from those conditions, she should thank Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and all of the army of their successors. When that amendment to the Constitution is proclaimed from Washington, which we are dreaming of, which will declare that no citizen shall be disfranchised franchised because of sex, that is when our work will reap its harvest. God grant I may be alive to see it. We learned all about what's happening in Texas with this celebration. And now I would like to introduce another very important Texas lady the National Chair of the Commemorative Events Committee, Betty Bird. She will tell us all about 
some more connections to the suffrage movement. Betty, welcome. Thank you, Jane. It's my privilege to tell you, first of all, about two Texas women that were very involved in the suffrage movement. The first one is Jane McCallum, who was born in 1877 in Wilson County, which is southeast of San Antonio. At the age of 18, she married Arthur McCallum, and by 1903, they had moved to Austin, where he became superintendent of school. She reared five children, but still find, found time first to go to the University of Texas from 1912 to 1915, where she became one of the first mothers to attend UT. And she also pledged a sorority, becoming the first married woman to do so. All this time, she is rearing five children. At this time, she became active in the women's suffrage and wrote editorials for the Austin paper called Suffrage Corner. In 1915, she was elected president of the Austin Women's Suffrage Association and became active in the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. During World War I, she supported prohibition and was a women's chair for the fourth Liberty Bond Drive, raising $700,000 in Austin. In 1917, she organized a public demonstration in front of the Texas Capitol against Governor James Ferguson, who was opposing women's suffrage. This was the first public demonstration in front of the Capitol, and it lasted for 16 hours, in which both men and women spoke. In 1918, she was there to watch Governor William Hobby sign a bill allowing women to vote in the Texas primary. And in 1920, she became very active in the Texas League of Women's Voters and the state chair for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But she didn't stop there. She then became part of the Petticoat Lobby, which was a group of six women's organizations who lobbied for prison reform, maternal infant health care, restrictions on child labor, and stricter prohibition laws, many of which were passed. Then in 1927, Jane McCallum became the second woman to be appointed Texas Secretary of State by Governor Dan Moody. She served his two terms, and then in 1931, she was reappointed as the Texas Secretary of State by Governor Ross Sterling, becoming the only man or woman to serve under two governors. And it was while she was Secretary of State in 31 that she discovered an original copy of the Texas Declaration of Independence in a vault and then wrote a book called Women Pioneers on the Lives of Early American Women Leaders. Through the 30s and 40s, she wrote a column for the American Austin American statesman called Woman and Her Ways, it was active in the Texas Democratic Party. And in 1954, she became the first female commissioner of a Travis County grand jury. This was after women had won the right to serve on juries. Jane McCallum died in 1957 and is buried in the Oakwood Cemetery in Austin. The other Texas woman I'd like to mention is Florence M. Sterling from Houston. She was born in 1871 in Anahuac, never married, and worked her whole life for her brothers as both secretary and treasurer of their company, Humble Oil Company, later Exxon. In 1916, she was the second vice president of the Texas branch of the National Woman's Party the Houston Suffrage League, the Women's Political League of Houston, and the Texas Women's Democratic League. She was also involved in the Texas branch of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. But during, 19, during the war, World War I, she was a member of the executive board of the Houston Red Cross and treasurer of the Houston War Camp Community Service. In 1923, Florence Sterling founded the magazine Woman's Viewpoint, 
she wanted people to see things through the eyes of women. The magazine was edited and written entirely by women and urged women to vote, supported clean government, drug enforcement laws, and world peace. Unfortunately, the magazine folded in 1927. From 1923 to 1925, she was president of the Houston League of Women Voters, became well known for her civic and club work. She was treasurer of the Houston Recreation and Community Service Association and director of peace and arbitration of the Texas Women's Christian Temperance Union. Florence Sterling died in 1940 and was buried in the Glenwood Cemetery in Houston. The third lady is the one that's best well, is the best known. And this is Alice Paul. She was born in 1885 in New Jersey to Quaker parents. And it's been said that Alice attended suffrage meetings when she was a little girl, when her mother would take her. In 1905, she graduated from Swarthmore College with a biology degree and then a master's in sociology from Columbia University. She then went to London to study social work and it was there that she joined the women's suffrage movement and began learning the militant tactics that were used in England, hunger strikes, picketing, and she was arrested three times while she was still in England. She returned and in 1910 got her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. In 1912, she joined the National American Women's Suffrage Association. This was a group that focused on going to each state for a constitution, for an amendment for women's suffrage. But she split from this group and founded the National Women's Party, focused on a constitutional amendment. Starting in 1913, she organized a parade with floats and 8,000 women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in support of women's suffrage. By 1917, there was the Alice Paul and 1,000 Silent Sentinels who began picketing in front of the White House, which was the first time any, there had been any kind of political protest in front of the White House. These women stood verbal and physical attacks that were accused of not being patriotic during World War I. Eventually, they were arrested and sentenced to seven months in a notorious workhouse in Virginia. There, Alice Paul organized a hunger strike. And these women, particularly Alice Paul, suffered forced feedings, which involved a rubber tube being put down her throat, beatings, and other forms of torture, such as sleep deprivation. But the treatment became so bad that it turned the tide and garnered them a lot of support and sympathy. And I don't think you can see this. This is a pen that she gave called Jail for Freedom that she gave to all of the women who were in prison with her. Finally, in 1918, President Wilson announced his support of women's suffrage. And in 1920, Tennessee, as we know, became the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. And Alice Paul sewed the 36th star on a flag that she had been making as each state ratified the amendment, she stowed a star on this flag. And she was with great pleasure and many photo opportunities shows her show, sewing that last flag. Now that you know about Alice Paul's early life, I would like to introduce to you Ellen Norton of Lady Washington chapter, who had the privilege of interviewing Mrs. Paul in her later life. So now let's go to Mrs. Paul's next chapter. I recently wrote an article for the Lady Washington DAR newsletter titled 
two days with my hero, Alice Paul. I think by the end of this, you'll see why I gave it that title. In 1976, I was a member of the National Organization for Women, or NOW. In passing, I heard that the Equal Rights Amendment, or ERA, had been written in 1923 by a woman named Alice Paul. I had never heard of her, as, most, as with most people in 1976, and I decided I needed to find out more. Alice Paul was born in 1885 to a Quaker family. She attended Swarthmore College and got a PhD in sociology in uh, 1912. After that, she joined the women's suffrage movement full time. In the US in 1912, women could vote only in a very few states. Alice Paul decided that an amendment to the U.S. Constitution was the only solution. From 1912 to 1920, she organized suffrage parades, picketing at the White House, confrontation with Woodrow Wilson, and she courted newspaper coverage. Initially, she and her national women's parties tactics were too confrontational for the older establishment suffragettes, but then they saw that Alice Paul's vision and methods worked. Led by the politically astute Carrie Chapman Catt, the establishment suffragettes replaced their state-by-state -state strategy with a demand for a constitutional amendment, and then they worked tirelessly for that goal. Together, Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Catt were the two pivotal leaders from 1912 to 1920 in getting women the vote. Alice Paul, however, only ever saw the 19th Amendment as a first step. Because there was still significant legal discrimination against women, she attended law school, and then in 1923, she wrote the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a master politician and an excellent networker, with allies in both political parties, in Congress, state capitals, and among America's elites. As a leader of the National Women's Party, she and her colleagues got the ERA introduced into Congress every year from 1923 until 1972 when it passed. But she also achieved many, many other wins for women. She was active in fighting for women's equality at the United Nations from its very beginning in 1945. She worked closely with congressional allies to ensure that the prohibition of discrimination in the workplace based on sex was included in the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There's a good chance if it wasn't for Alice Paul, discrimination based on sex would not be in either one of those acts. She, uh, and these are just some of her many, many uh, achievements. In 1976, when she was 92 years old and living in New Jersey, I knew I had to interview her for posterity. I was an MBA student at the University of Houston, and I lobbied for a grant from the university to do so. I got the grant and spent two days with her. The Houston Post published a half-page article about my interview with Alice Paul in January 1977. And now I think most of you will understand my fascination with and gratitude toward Alice Paul.
How did meeting Alice Paul change your life? Meeting Alice Paul let, made me realize that a determined woman can do anything. I was very young. I was only 26 at the time that I met Alice Paul. And I was basically a struggling grad student finding her way. And Alice Paul taught me, yes, women can do it because it wasn't always clear in the 1960s and 70s society didn't always think women could do it she was an inspirational model i'm glad to see you here at aquapond workhouse thank you for visiting me have you heard any news on alice paul the last I heard, she was in solitary confinement. She intentionally threw her shoes at the cells, glass windows, breaking them. We could talk to her when we were in the courtyard. Then they boarded up her windows and we haven't heard anything. You haven't heard anything? I know that she is still on a hunger strike, as we all are. We are all being force fed twice a day. It is all we can think about here all day. I dread it. It's beyond horrible, and the guards and medical staff are very rough. During the process, prison medical staff clutch me by my windpipe and choke me. I feel as though I can't breathe. When the egg-milk mixture is dumped directly into my stomach, it feels like a ball of lead. We are injured in the process, so we cough up a lot of blood, have frequent severe nosebleeds, and vomit frequently. I have a lot of pain. All the officers here know we are ma making this hunger strike, that women fighting for liberty may be considered political prisoners. All of us have told them. Were you there on sentencing day? Suffragists were sentenced from six days to six months in prison. I received the longest sentence of six months. In pronouncing the lightest sentence upon Mrs. Nolan, the judge said that he did so on account of her age. He urged her to pay the $25 fine, hinting that jail might be too severe on her and might bring on death. At this suggestion, tiny Mrs. Nolan pulled herself up on her toes and said with great dignity, Your Honor, I have a nephew fighting for democracy in France. He is offering his life for his country. I should be ashamed if I did not join these brave women in their fight for democracy in America. I should be proud of the honor to die in prison for the liberty of American women. Even the judge seemed moved by her beautiful and simple spirit. Remembering Mrs. Nolan's speech keeps me strong during the bad times here. So the headlining story I want you to write up for the suffragist newspaper is about the night of terror. One night ago, Superintendent Whittaker told his guards to brutalize and terrorize only the suffragist prisoners. We were beaten, kicked, shoved, and more. Mrs. Kosu had a heart attack and didn't receive medical attention until morning. I was handcuffed to the highest bars of my cell and left there all night just for asking the others how they were. Mr. Whittaker came to the door and told us not to dare speak or he would put the braces bit in our mouths and the street jackets on our bodies. We were so terrified we kept very still. We all, all still sporting bruises and injuries. It was terrifying. When you write the article for the suffragist newspaper, be sure to call the event the Night of Terror. Yes, I'm sporting a new look. I'm now forced to wear the prison uniform after the Night of Terror. It is filthy from the many women who wore it before me. I'm crawling with bugs. Did you bring any soap? The same piece of soap is used by every prisoner, including the prostitutes. Many of the prisoners in Aquapon are seriously afflicted with syphilis, so this soap sharing practice is appallingly negligent. Conditions in here have not improved at all. The place is alive with roaches crawling all over the walls everywhere, but the rats are the worst. As I've mentioned before, the food here is full of worms, so we can't bear to put it in our mouths. It's so awful. We've made a game of counting the worms in our meal. I won the game yesterday with 24 worms. All news cheers one marvelously because it's hard to feel anything but a bit desolate and forgotten here in this place. Please remind our readers that we protest against these 
unjust sentences and convictions. We say we prefer the workhouse to the payment of a $25 fine imposed for an offense of which we are not guilty. As long as the government and the representatives of the government prefer to send women to jail on petty and technical charges, we will go to jail. Persecution has always advanced the cause of justice. The right of American women to work for democracy must be maintained. We would hinder, not help, the whole cause of freedom for women if we weakly submitted to persecution now. God knows we don't want other women ever to have to do this over again. Our work for the passage of the amendment must go on. It will go on. Helena Hill Weed, suffragist, political prisoner, MSDAR Vice President General, Class of 1905, and Champion of Human Rights. Helena Charlotte Hill was the daughter of Congressman Ebenezer Hill and Mary Ellen Mossman Hill of Connecticut, U.S. Congressman Ebenezer Hill was a Civil War veteran and served in Congress from 1895 to 1913. Helena Hill was one of America's first female geologists, having studied at Vassar College and the Montana School of Mines. She was a founding member of the Women's National Press Club and a Vice President General of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Miss Helena Hill married Walter Weed, a wealthy mining engineer, in December 1896. They had three children. Their union lasted 18 years but ended in divorce in 1914. The gossip sections of newspapers carried the news that Helena filed for divorce due to infidelity. Mrs. Weed participated in the massive suffrage possession held on March 3, 1913, the day before President Wilson's inauguration. Mobs of men attacked the women and the police did nothing to control the crowd or protect the women from their attackers. Mrs. Weed testified to a special subcommittee of the United States Senate about what she experienced during the attacks during the procession. The committee was investigating the actions of the DC police. On June 22, 1917, Lucy Burns and Dora Lewis picketed the White House with the inflammatory Russian banner, accusing President Wilson and the American envoy Elihu Root of deceiving Russia by claiming the United States a democracy. An angry crowd destroyed the banner. Two days later, Lucy Burns and Catherine Morey were the first pickets arrested while demonstrating outside the White House. They were never brought to trial. Mrs. Weed was a prominent member of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage and the National Women's Party. She was among the American suffragists who picketed the White House on Independence Day in 1917. She was arrested on July 4, 1917 and served three days in district jail for obstructing sidewalk traffic and carrying a banner that said governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Mrs. Weed, while waiting for the prison paddy wagon to transport her to jail, listened to the trial of William J. Kane, charged with seizing and tearing banners carried by the suffragists. He was convicted and fined $25 or sentenced to 60 days in jail. Mrs. Weed, a patriot at heart, called Kane over to her. He told her that he was only a yeoman in the Navy and could not afford to lose the money nor spend 60 days in jail. Mrs. Weed promptly produced $25 and passed the bills over to Kane. Ironically, this was the same amount of her fine, which she refused to pay, as she felt that she was not guilty of any offense. After serving her sentence of three days in jail, Mrs. Weed took a taxi to the police headquarters and demanded the banners the police captured on July 4th. She was given approximately 30 banners, most torn to tatters. When the taxi cab left headquarters, Mrs. Weed hoisted a banner through the open top of the cab that stated, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? She left a staring crowd in her wake while policemen racked their brains to figure out some regulation that would cover the militant's audacity. On October 20th, 1917, the day after police announced that future picketers would receive a sentence of six months for unlawful protest, the National Women's Party leader Alice Paul led the picket line. Her banner read, the time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there is but one choice. We have made it. 
The slogan, adapted from Woodrow Wilson's own words, was used throughout the country on posters supporting the war effort. Alice Paul declared her own war against injustice by co-opting the battle cry for the cause of women's suffrage. As she declared in 1919, when men are denied justice, they go to war. This is our war, only we are fighting it with banners instead of guns. This group would receive six months at Aquaquan Workhouse for their protest. Helena Hill Weed was arrested again in January of 1918 for applauding in court, for which she served a day in jail. In August of that year, she was arrested for participating in the pro-suffrage Lafayette Square meeting in which her sister Elsie Hill spoke. Mrs. Weed served 15 days at Aquaquan Workhouse, but she was not there during the Night of Terror. Helena Hill Weed in 1927 was a candidate for mayor of Norwalk, Connecticut. She lost, but in this photograph, she proudly wears her NSDAR past Vice President General Sash. Aside from her work for women's suffrage, she served as the National Secretary of the Haiti Santo Domingo Independence Society. She also wrote articles in support of Haitian independence for the magazine, The Nation. When Helena Hill Weed died in 1958 at the age of 83, Time magazine described her as a kinetic suffragette who crisscrossed the nation crusading for the right to vote. Champion of human rights is carved on her headstone. You know the drill. Please no screenshots, photographs, audio or video recording of this program or any of the programs in our webinar. The speaker holds the compilation copyrights on the recording. Thank you. Winning the vote required 72 years of ceaseless agitation by three generations of dedicated, fearless suffragists who sought to overturn centuries of law and millennia of tradition concerning gender roles. The women who launched the movement were dead by the time it was completed. The women who secured its final success weren't born when it began. It took 19 campaigns with 19 successive U.S. Congresses, more than 900 local, state, and national campaigns involving tens of thousands of grassroots volunteers financed by millions of dollars of donations by women across the country. We finally engineered the greatest expansion of democracy in a single day that the world has ever seen. Woman suffrage is a long story of hard work and heartache crowned by victory. Victory is finally ours. I have lived to realize the big beautiful dream of my life the enfranchisement of women. We are no longer petitioners. We are not wards of the nation, but free and equal citizens. Let us practice the dignity of a sovereign people. We have proved in Tennessee that this is a government of the people, not an empire of corporations. Let us do our part to keep it a true and triumphant democracy. Thank you for inviting me to share the history of women's suffrage in America with you. Horton Sparks Ward. Born in Matagorda County, Texas in 1872, Ward was 11 when she moved with her family to Edna where her father was a deputy sheriff. After attending Nazareth Academy in Victoria, Ward returned to Edna where she began teaching in 1890. Ward married Albert Malsh and they had three daughters. The family later moved to Houston. In 1906, the 34-year-old Ward divorced Malsh and supported her daughters by working as a court stenographer. The law captured Ward's interest. She studied law through correspondence courses while working at the law office of William Henry Ward, who became her second husband. After successfully passing the Texas bar exam with the second highest score of 94.7, Ward began practicing with her husband. The couple formed the firm of Ward and Ward. Some biographical reports indicate Ward did not appear in court because she feared that having a female lawyer involved in a case might prejudice all male juries. But in 1915, she represented the plaintiffs in an insurance case heard in the 17th District Court in Fort Worth. Ward won the case. 
Also in 1915, she became the first Texas woman admitted to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court. Throughout her career, Ward championed the rights of women. In 1913, she led a successful effort to persuade the Texas legislature to pass the Married Woman's Property Rights Law, which gave married women partial control over their separate property and community property. Suffragists pointed to Mrs. Ward as their Lone Star voter in the Lone Star State. Until the passage of a bill granting primary suffrage to women, Texas had a lone voter, Mrs. Hortons Ward. As a member of the Texas Bar, she could only vote at the election of special judges. Ward also played a key role in the women's suffrage movement. Ward was a key player in persuading the Texas legislature to pass a bill allowing women to vote in primary elections, which passed in March of 1918. As president of the Houston Equal Suffrage Association in 1918, her newspaper articles on voting requirements and the pamphlet Instructions for Women Voters, distributed statewide, were part of a grassroots campaign by the Texas Equal Suffrage Association that persuaded nearly 386,000 women to register to vote in just 17 days in the summer of 1918. On June 27, 1918, Hortons Ward became the first woman to register to vote in Harris County, Texas. Ward, described by the Houston Post as an ardent suffragist who has worked long and faithfully for this privilege, was one of 466 women who registered that day. Many showed up an hour or more before courthouse officials began allowing them to register. A crowd of men gathered to gawk at the sight, according to news reports, as the women proved that they were of voting age, paying their poll tax and registering to vote. Ward lobbied Governor W.P. Hobby and the legislature to ratify the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. Texas became the ninth state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Winning the vote for women did not help Hortons Ward in 1920 when she was the first woman to run for judicial office in Texas. Ward ran for Harris County Judge. She lost the race, but in August 1923, the Houston City Council appointed Ward as temporary judge of the city's corporation court while the presiding judge was on vacation. Ward, the first woman in Texas to hold a judicial position, served six days on that court, handing out fines for traffic law violations and drunkenness. The fraternal organization Woodman of the World was in a land dispute in El Paso County that had been appealed to the Texas Supreme Court. The Woodmen were a powerful political organization of the day and their membership included many prominent men of the state, including all three justices of the Supreme Court. The justices were forced to recuse themselves from the case. Governor Pat Neff tried in vain to find male attorneys to appoint to hear the case, only to find that each man he approached was also a Woodman. Finally, Neff decided to appoint three female attorneys to hear the case. After some effort to find women who had been practicing the legal minimum of seven years, he settled on three prominent lawyers, Hortons Ward of Houston and two other women, to the state Supreme Court to hear Johnson versus Dar. Of the three women, Neff designated Ward as the Chief Justice. When Ward was sworn in as Special Chief Justice, a smile broke out on Mrs. Ward's face as she recited the oath requiring the justices to swear that they had never fought in a duel. Texas attracted national attention for what the press dubbed the All Women's Supreme Court. The All Women's Supreme Court began its work on the case in January 1925, shortly after Miriam A. Ferguson took office as Texas's first female governor. Heralded with headlines about petticoat politics and the fair sex presiding, the trio of women held court January 8, 1925. Even the New York Times covered the proceedings. Absent, though, was the clerk of the court. According to papers in the Texas State Library, he arrived with a cane fishing pole and a jug, saying, I'll be danged if I'm going to nursemaid a bunch of women. I'm going fishing. Deputy Clerk H.L. Clamp carried on. In May, the special Supreme Court handed down a unanimous ruling in favor of the Woodmen. Despite the novelty of the case, women continued to be at a legal disadvantage in Texas for many years to come. It was not until 1954 that women were allowed to serve on juries, and not until 1982, 57 years after Hortons Ward served on the all-woman Supreme Court, that a woman was appointed to serve full-time on the Texas Supreme Court. Hortons Ward became known as a champion of women's rights, writing stirring newspaper articles and pamphlets, and personally lobbying for many social reform measures in the early 1900s. 
She also campaigned for a 54 hour week for women in industry, a woman's division in the State Department of Labor, a domestic relations court, and the right of women to serve as officers of corporations. Ward did not live to see another woman serve on the state's highest civil court. She died in 1944. I'm Hortense Ward. Here's Ray Bryant to tell you how a lawsuit I initiated impacted the women in the city of Houston in 1920. My name's Ray Bryant and I'm with the Houston Suffragist Project. And my role today is to explain to you a project a group of us had last year to find the Houston story, the local story about the suffragists. We wanted to document their lives, put their names up on the Houston Genealogical Forum's website. But instead, we uncovered a story we had no idea. In fact, nobody had an idea about it. And uh, it has to do with what began after the August 1920 ratification and certification. Now everybody knows the story of what happened in Tennessee and we were all excited, but about a third of the states in the United States had a poll tax. There was another battle ahead and Texas is a poll tax state. So in the Texas constitution from 1877, it has very strict rules about what, can, what qualifies an individual to be able to vote. So the Texas legislature came up with a compromise that would combine the 1918 and 1919 poll tax lists and then also give a two week window where any other women or men could register to vote. So then let's get to the October two week period. After all the excitement, the suffragists knew there were gonna be thousands of women who would pay, but unfortunately there were very few and they got worried. So women decided they were gonna take the opportunity to pay to other women. They set up tables, they got deputized, and they increased the voting ranks by about another thousand people, even on the last day. This still was short of what the hopes. Now in Houston, we're lucky. We have Hortense Sparks Ward. She's a lioness for the suffragists in Texas and specifically in Houston. She crafted a lawsuit for her friend um, to be able to sue, and their goal was to destroy the poll tax. They found a judge, Judge Harvey. He heard the case nine days before the election, and he agreed. This blew it open. Now women throughout Houston, Harris County could vote for free, and she hoped that other counties would follow suit, but that didn't happen. Not everybody was excited. We have the existing poll tax, I mean the existing election officials, and they decided on their own, they were gonna circulate a letter and ignore the judge's ruling and turn away the women on election day in order to throw the election. Well, this letter was leaked to the press. Hortense found out, boy, was she mad. She said, there's gonna be fireworks. I'm taking you back to court, and that's what happened. Now, the second time it went to court, which was the day before the election on November 1st, 13 women were plaintiffs. And hundreds of women had signed petitions. 13 suffragist organizations presented petitions. You can read the resolution that was presented to the court on that day. The judge agreed he would hold any poll worker who turned away an otherwise qualified woman in contempt. Still not to be outdone, when the election opened the next day, over half the election officials didn't show up. The polls didn't have enough workers. Women stepped up again and they said, we will man the polls. We will collect the ballots. We will count them. In some of the precincts, there were over a hundred women in line at eight o'clock. In the African-American community, because we have to remember this is segregationist, this is Jim Crow times in 1920, the men brought women in large groups and they stood for hours with the men protecting them from potential violence. They nursed their babies in line for hours. At the end of the day, when the polls closed, thousands of women had voted. But sadly, 
Even though this was a historic day, you can see the headlines. Within three months, the Texas Constitution was changed and women were not again able to vote in Houston for free until 1966, 46 years later. This story is not over. We are growing. Other people are coming in to help us throughout the whole community. We have different groups and we are asking women, if you'll notice the grandmothers, the great grandmothers, even great, great grandmothers, we want pictures, we want stories. There are so many gaps. The, what we're putting together, we already have an arrangement with the special collections at the University of Texas. They are the regional archives for women's studies in the Houston area. And instead of just looking back 100 years, we're the story today of us looking back. So in the future, they will have this collection. We know time is not in our side. The living memories, those boxes, those special things, we need to grab them now. And things are out there. We need poll tax lists. We need stories. We need any other documents. So please go to our website, the Houston Genealogical Forum. Right now, it's our project is not quite ready and up, but we will be by August 26th. See if you recognize names. You're going to see women who were powerhouses in 1920, and you're going to see women who, were, who are growing into the, their futures, who are leaders, both in education, science, medicine, schools, and leaders in the arts. This was the training ground of mentors for women in 1920. So learn more about the women. We'll have their names, their professions, ages, where they lived. We know all kinds of things about them. We even have an interactive map so you can see where they lived. You can click on them. It's exciting for us. We're excited at the response. And we hope that this is a challenge for you throughout Texas. Find your own count of stories. There's a story everywhere. Be surprised. Please visit hgftx.org. Hello, I'm Carolyn Shuey, State Co-Chair of the Texas DAR Commemorative Events Committee, and I'm here to pay tribute to the suffragist. 100 years ago today, an extraordinary victory was achieved. The passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment made it a part of the Constitution of the United States of America. Not only did the amendment give women the right to vote, it opened doors of opportunity for women, which had only been imagined in their dreams. Thus, half of the population of our nation was added to the voting rolls, and the 19th Amendment became the cornerstone of the women's rights movement. Historians agree that the adoption of the 19th Amendment is one of the most significant events of the 20th century. Today, we honor these women for who they were and what they did. The hard-won legacy they left to us is a precious gift which we should respect and protect. Let us join together in tribute to these remarkable women by affirming the women's right to vote. So cast your ballot with pride. And now we're going to see some amazing artwork created by very talented daughters who were inspired by the suffrage movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment. Here, we have a wall hanging quilt handmade by Joanne Gentry of the Rock Wall chapter. This beautiful photography collage was created by Deb Evans from the Alexander Love chapter. This beautiful wall hanging quilt was crafted by Janice Keene from the San Gabriel chapter. This colorful tile was created by Judy Rosenthal of the Lady Washington chapter. This beautiful piece by Christine Heron of the Lady Washington chapter took third place in the American Heritage Committee contest in the crafts, paper crafts category. Here we see Mary Waters 
from the Teha Lana chapter and her artwork that took first place in the art and sculpture sculpture category of the American Heritage Committee contest. This incredible piece is the first place national winner in the fiber arts quilt top category of the American Heritage Committee contest. It is entitled, They Shall Be Heard by Mary K. Davis of the Santa Clara chapter in California. We are truly honored to have so many talented daughters amongst us and their work is so inspiring. Thanks to Carolyn Shiwi, the Texas State Co-Chair of the Commemorative Events Committee for that beautiful written tribute to our wonderful Pathfinders. There was another lady that did the same not through writing, but through art. She became a national DAR American Heritage Committee first place winner with this watercolor picture. She is Nancy Ball from a North Carolina DAR Society chapter. Nancy Ball. It was my painting that received the very great honor um, to win the American Heritage Contest this year. The painting is a celebration of women who followed the passage of the 19th Amendment, who seized the opportunities that it provided, and blazed a trail of accomplishments that would provide a path for all the rest of us. Every person in the painting is a, real, is a real individual who made a special contribution. In order to start out doing this, I made a list of what I call first ladies. That is um, the first American women to be elected to public office on a national level. And um, then I decided that that was a little bit too narrow and so I broadened it to include the names of individuals who um, had made an important first in the field of medicine or um, art or literature, um, science and medicine. And then I thought, well, maybe I will include something else. And so I, I then added women whose participation brought about significant changes um, that broke long-time barriers, like in sports. So we have some sports people too. And you can see the painting behind me, but you can't really see it very well. So I made a copy, which I'll put up close for you. And I'll tell you who these people are because each one represents a real person. Start at the top, she's holding the flag, and that is Carrie Chapman Catt. She was a prominent suffragette, and she was the founder of the League of Women Voters. Next to her is Alice Paul. Alice lived from 1885 to 1977. She she formed the National Women's Party. She helped write the original text for the Equal Rights Amendment. Jane Adams is next to her. Jane has got the black hat on. Um, she was a social reformer, a suffragette, a pacifist. She was a pioneer in women's rights. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. And the far right in that same line was Mary Church Terrell. She was the first black woman to graduate from college. She was active in women's rights and the passage of the 19th Amendment. She was a founder of the National Association of Colored Women. Next to her um, is Hattie Wyatt, 
Hattie Wyatt Carraway. Hattie lived from 1878 to 1950. She was the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate in 1931. And she was the first woman to chair a Senate committee and the first woman to preside over the Senate in 1943. Next to her is Mary McLeod Bethune. She lived from 1875 to 1955. She was an educator and activist for the rights of women. And for African Americans, she was president of the National Association of Colored Women. And she was an advisor to FDR and Harry Truman. The lady holding up the pipette and squinting at it is Dr. Gertie Corey. She was a naturalized American citizen. She lived from 1896 to 1975. She was a biochemist. She was the first, um, the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1947 for her groundbreaking discovery of how metabolism works. Next to her is Amelia Earhart. Amelia lived from 1897 and was too soon lost in 1937. She was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic. Edith Wharton is the one in the funny hat. Edith was a writer. She was the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature in 1921 for her book, The Age of Innocence. Jeanette Rankin is at the far right, looking sort of sideways. She was the first woman in Congress in 1916. She was a Republican from Montana, and she was elected again in 1940. In the next row down, okay, in the, in the red sweater on the left-hand side with the golf club is Babe Didrikson Zaharias. She lived from 1911 to 1956. She was an extraordinary athlete, super athlete in many, in many sports, a golfer, an Olympic medalist in track and field, and a role model for women in sports. She was the founder of the LPGA. Next to her is a, a sportswoman, Gertrude Ederly, who lived from 1905 to 2003. She was a competitive swimmer, an Olympic medalist in 1924. She was the first woman to swim across the English Channel in 1926. Next to her, with the glasses on, is Antonia Novello. She was a doctor, and she was born in 1944. She was the first woman and the first Hispanic to serve as U.S. Surgeon General. Alice Coachman is in a sports jacket, the U.S. sports jacket. She was the first black woman and the only American to win an Olympic gold medal in the year 1928. In the next row is Althea Gibson. She was a tennis trailblazer, a golfer, she was the first black woman to compete in international tennis in 1950. She broke the barrier, the racial barrier on women's professional golf also. Eleanor Roosevelt, she was a humanitarian. Eleanor lived from 1884 to 1962. She was a humanitarian, an activist, an advocate of women's rights. She redefined the role of first lady. She was a delegate to the UN and chaired the Commission on Human Rights. Then we have Rosie the Riveter. Now, Rosie was not a real person, of course. She dated from the 1940s, but she was a World War II icon that represented female workers in def the defense industries who often replaced men who joined the military. Rosie changed perceptions of women's place in society, a change that is still felt today. Margaret Hamilton was a NASA engineer, is 
about, she was born in 1936. She was the woman who got man to the moon. Remember when the spacecraft radioed back, Houston, we have a problem. It was Margaret who solved that. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. On the left side is Sally Ride. Sally lived from 1951 to 2012. She was an astronaut and a physicist. She was the first American woman in space as a crew member on the space shuttle Challenger in 1983. Next to her is Shirley Chisholm. Shirley lived from 1924 to 2005. She was the first black woman to be elected to the US House of Representatives in 1965 and the first black woman to be a Democrat nominee to run for president. Sandra Day O'Connor is next to, next to Shirley in the robes. Sandra lived from 1930, I guess Sandra's still alive, she was the first woman justice to serve on the US Supreme Court. Below Sandra is Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is the first woman speaker of the US House of Representatives. She's the highest ranking female elected official in the US history. Next to Nancy is General Ann E. Dunwoody, retired. She is the first woman in US military service history to achieve the rank of four-star general. Near the bottom there is Toni Morrison, who lived from 1931 to 2019. Toni was a writer, a teacher. She was a winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1988 for Beloved and the Nobel Prize in Literature 1993 as well as receiving many other awards for, for, for her literature. Janet Yellen is an economist. Janet was the first woman to chair the board of the Federal Reserve. And last but not least is Hillary Clinton. Hillary was born in 1947. She was the first woman nominated by a major political party to run for the office of president of the US. And there you have my ladies, these women were the very first trailblazers who created a path for the rest of us to follow thanks to the 19th amendment. And thank you for having me. Happy birthday. Chapter, An Individual Challenge. Discover your local suffrage stories. Be a trailblazer. The project of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites, the National Votes for Women Trail, is collecting sites from all over our country to allow us to tell the untold stories of suffrage for all women of all ethnicities that extends well past the passage of the 19th Amendment. We currently have 44 state coordinators and over 1,000 sites on our database, which continues to grow at a rapid pace. Our partner, the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, is complementing our efforts with the donation of 250 historic roadside markers nationally. This slide shows you the locations all over the United States that are identified and in this database. This webinar is done by and for Texas Daughters of the American Revolution members. However, everything described within can be done for any U.S. location. This slide shows the locations in Texas which have been identified and are in this database. Here I have zoomed in to the city of Dallas. This map shows four sites representing a suffrage event that occurred at these locations. The website uses purple icons that are a little difficult to see. I've circled them in red so you can see how they look. When you hover your mouse over a purple icon, a box pops up to inform you what this location is and what occurred there. 
This location identifies the Dallas County Old Red County Courthouse and that Margaret Bell Houston was involved. The organization involved was the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association and this location has a Texas historical marker. This location is Miller Moore Mansion. This identifies the organization involved as the Dallas Heritage Village. There is a lot of information here. This slide identifies the Adolphus Hotel. Ladies, it says here that Elizabeth Freeman, a New Yorker, and Lavinia Eagle from Washington, D.C. both attended a convention held at the Adolphus Hotel in 1916. They were two veteran activists, and because of their efforts in Texas, the number of suffrage clubs increased from 21 to 80. That means that there are 80 Texas locations where these clubs had meetings we can locate. The database can be viewed in a different way, similar to an Excel worksheet. It takes a little getting used to, but here you see my search shows the Dallas locations with dates and explanations. Here is a location we all know, the Texas State Fair Park, and it is the site of the DAR house and the meeting location of the Jane Douglas chapter, who are excellent caretakers of the house. This icon identifies the Texas State Fair Park. The Dallas Equal Suffrage Association, under the auspices of the Texas State Suffrage Association, coordinated events at the fair in 1913, 1914, and 1915. They held suffrage days and they were very successful. I am briefly leaving this site and showing the National Park Service's story map of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. When did your state ratify the 19th Amendment? At the bottom of the screen, you can see a sliding section of different pop-up windows. They are numbered. You can use this for any state, but I will use Texas as my example. Texas was the ninth state to ratify. Texas is window number 11 in the bottom row. Numbers one and two are informational windows. Each state has a place identified that are recognized for their historical significance and are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, a National Park Service program. Some of these places are open to the public while others are privately owned. When you click on Texas number 11, you see this beautiful picture of the entrance to the Texas State Fair Park in Dallas. There is an informational section with the picture that tells about the state and when it ratified the 19th Amendment and about the historical location highlighted. Now we're back to the first website, the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. I challenge each and every one of you to get involved. Surely every community has some suffrage story. Find out about it. They have a guide to get you started. I checked out the video and found that their YouTube video worked better for me. Here is a list of ideas of where to look in your local community for suffrage sites. The centennial of women's suffrage in the United States is approaching in 2020. With this landmark anniversary, the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites and the William G. Pomeroy Foundation have partnered to launch a new historic marker program commemorating the history of women's suffrage in the U.S. The Pomeroy Foundation, which is a private grant-making foundation based in Syracuse, New York, is providing grants through its National Women's Suffrage Marker Grant Program in order to support recognizing historically significant people, places, or things instrumental to women in gaining the right to vote in 1920. Historical markers awarded through the program will become part of the National Votes for Women Trail, which is run through the NCWHS and documents the Campaign for Women's Suffrage that took place over more than seven decades and was conducted in parlors, churches, town halls, parks, union halls, and other community locations. The program is open to all municipalities, nonprofit academic institutions, and 501c3 organizations in the United States. Pomeroy Foundation signage grants are fully funded and cover the entire cost of the marker, pole, and shipping. The grant recipient is responsible for installation of the marker. For more information about this program and how to apply, contact them through this website. Look at that! This is Carrie Chapman Katz's childhood home in Iowa, and it already has a marker. 
this YouTube video worked better for me versus the one on the website. It is called Become a Trailblazer. You see, the beginning started recording prior to the meeting starting. So it's got the same visual slide on the screen for a while. You can fast forward through that screen that indicates you should wait. For a brief informative segment, start at the 16 minute 42 second mark and go at least through 20, the 23 minute mark. So just about five minutes. It looks like the communities are so excited to have a marker. Look, this site has two markers. They're not side by side, but they're right next to each other. To quote the video, the impact that we are having on doing this research is adding to the body of knowledge of American history that's never been done before. Sometimes we don't know about the local contributions that added to women winning the vote and becoming citizens. Can we do it? Yes, we can. I can't wait to hear about your efforts in recognizing the suffrage events and people in your local communities. I'm Denise Bennett, TXDAR Vice Chair of Commemorative Events, focusing on women's suffrage. The 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, giving women the vote, is quickly approaching. Sadly, due to the ongoing pandemic, we cannot commemorate together. I challenge chapters and individuals to commemorate the 100th anniversary anyway, but at a safe distance. Me and a few of my friends have come up with ideas of things everyone can do. At the end of this presentation will be a slide with all the websites mentioned. Be sure to have your cell phones ready to snap a picture so you can participate in my challenges. Be safe, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you in person very soon. I am Susan B. Anthony, and I encourage all women to vote. I voted on November 5, 1872 for Grant. I convinced the election registrars I had the right to vote because the 14th Amendment gave me that right as a citizen. I was arrested for voting, and the judge determined that women are not citizens of this fine country. We are considered members of the state. Non-voting members, I might add, exercise your right to vote. I'm Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In July of 1848, I wrote and read the Declaration of Sentiments at the very first National Women's Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. I never would have thought that 25 years later, in 1873, women would still not have the right to vote. At our Women's Convention in 1873, we commemorated the 25th anniversary of the first conference and created displays of historical items showing suffrage's progress. Create a woman's suffrage display at schools, libraries, courthouses, voting places, and other public places reminding everyone of what we have accomplished. Participate in a local parade as a suffragist. I'm Lucy Burns, and I worked tirelessly in organizing the March 3rd, 1913 Women's Suffrage Procession in Washington, D.C. There were nine bands, five mounted brigades, 20 floats, and close to 8,000 marchers. During this time of social distancing, chapters, groups, and individuals can participate in a virtual suffrage parade hosted by the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House. The parade is called Suffragist City Parade and is being held in Rochester, New York. See their website for more details. The deadline to enter is September 1st, 2020. I'm Carrie Chapman Catt, and I'm the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. I founded the League of Women Voters in 1920 to teach women how to read the ballot, register them as voters, and encourage them to make their vote count. Go to vote411.org to inform yourself on the local voting procedures, the candidates, the next election date, and more. I'm Hortons Ward. Request that your city light up in suffrage colors on August 26th. That's gold, white, and purple. Where did I put it? I can't find it. My original manuscript of the Declaration of Sentiments has been misplaced. Have you seen it? I have the printed copy by Frederick Douglass, but the White House called and asked for the original. Use the hashtag find the sentiments to help with the hunt for one of America's most important documents. To be disenfranchised is to be told that you do not matter. The right to vote is the power to govern your possibilities. I am Lucy Burns, and I hold the record 
for the most days in prison for woman suffrage, even more than my good friend Alice Paul. I used words as my weapons and wrote articles and edited entire newspapers devoted to woman suffrage. I created many banners which inflamed those in power and influenced people to think about this situation and change their way of thinking. Write articles or blog to inform and encourage citizens to do their civic duty and vote. I'm Hortense Ward, an attorney and trailblazing suffragist from Houston, Texas. I was the first woman ever to register to vote in Harris County, Texas in 1918. In 17 days, I persuaded 386,000 women in Texas to register to vote through my newspaper articles and my pamphlet, Instructions for Women Voters. I encourage you to volunteer at your local polling location for early and regular voting times. Help voters, especially new voters, understand how the voting process is done. The next election will be here before you know it. I'm Susan B. Anthony. I've donated all of my journals and records to the Library of Congress. They need volunteers like you to index and transcribe my papers and the papers of other women suffrage leaders. Go to the website on the screen. The vote is an emblem of your equality, women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. Women have suffered agony of soul, which you can never comprehend, that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Understand what it means and what it can do for your country. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. Progress is calling to you to make no pause. Act.